So everyone, welcome back. Uh, I'm going to tur turn it over to Arthur, who's, who uh, we're happy to have here from IHES. And, and Arthur's also a, a CUNY alum, so it's great to have him back. Um, and uh, he's going to talk about characterizing um, classical and quantum entropy. OK, great. Um, so thank you, John, for the introduction. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I've been having a really good time here so far, learning a lot of things. Just like David Spivak said in his talk, you're always going to try to pick up something uh, from learning. So I hope that um, maybe you'll get something out of this too. Uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you have questions, especially if they're questions about clarification or if you didn't hear me uh, properly or anything like that. So I want to start off by um, a rather a simple remark, which is that every function loses information. If you give me, um, if somebody has a die that's weighted and then they roll the die, but they don't tell you the outcome, they only tell you whether the outcome was odd or even, then you're not getting the full information of that die. You're only getting some kind of information. So every function loses information and um, that's really what often happens. And the way we quantify that information loss, as John Baez mentioned in his talk, is through the idea of an entropy difference associated to this process. And in this case, that process is just the fact that somebody is hiding the information. They're saying, I'm only going to tell you whether the outcome is odd or even. You think of that as sort of like a, a machine telling you some output. And in this picture, I'm going to give mathematical symbols to a lot of these things. Sometimes I'll draw pictures. Sometimes I'll draw mathematical symbols. I'll be working with finite sets for the first half of my talk and, and probability distributions on those finite sets. Um, and I'll try to use um, these kind of letters. So X and P, Y and Q. And here Q is the push forward of my probability measure. And um, Bias, Fritz, and Linster characterized this entropy difference, actually, as a continuous convex functor into the non-negative real numbers. And what that just means intuitively is that um, you associate to each process a specific number and it satisfies properties like compositionality so that if you iterate a process, you get the sum of the entropy differences. And actually John Baez spent a lot of time about the convex part of that where you take the two um, distribute, where you roll, where you essentially flip a coin to choose between two possible sets of outcomes. And then you um, get a convex linear relation there. I'll spend more time about the funk for reality. But more importantly, um, you wanna, what you want to do when you have such a process is you want to try to recover information. And when you only tell me the outcome, whether something was odd or even, you don't have a way to specify what the initial roll of the die was. But you have a rough estimate because you know if you see odd, it had to be one, three, or five. It couldn't have been two. So you can try to make some kind of a guess. But there's no function that actually represents that guess appropriately. But you can try to use a stochastic function. Instead of associating to each element, odd or even, a specific element of the roll of die, you can choose a probability distribution. And that's what I'm going to think of as when I think of a stochastic map. That's what I'm going to do. And you can think of those as conditional probabilities. There are many ways to think about stochastic maps. So you can choose whichever one you feel most comfortable with. And I'm going to call these maps hypotheses. And I'm going to use a different picture that um, I don't just have to think about rolls of die. I can think about something more abstract. And I'm going to use a picture that I learned from Gromov, which is that you can think of a probability distribution as a collection of water droplets whose total sum volume is some fixed number, one in this case. And then what, on any function, any, any genuine function is going to take these water droplets and combine them. And then the sum of the probabilities is just the sum of their volumes. So it's an analog picture for um, these kinds of maps that I'll be considering for a good portion of the talk. And the hypothesis is a way to take some output and then split that water droplet back up in such a way so that they line up. And what I mean by lining up formally is that they form a stochastic section in the language of topology. 
you can think of this as like a bundle, a projection map, and then a stochastic map that goes in the opposite direction that satisfies a one-sided identity equation. Not necessarily both sides, but one side. That's what the definition is of a hypothesis. Are you thinking of F as a, like a deterministic stochastic map? Yeah, so the question is, am I thinking of F also as a stochastic map? And the answer is absolutely yes. Every function is a particular kind of a stochastic map that's deterministic. To each input, I get a probability distribution that's essentially a Dirac delta at the image of that point. So that's exactly how I'll be thinking about them. And I'm glad you asked because I often forget to mention that. But yes, as you can see from this picture, not every hypothesis will reproduce the correct probability distribution back. In fact, there are many different hypotheses that you can guess. And so I wanna also measure the deviation of that too. And so to quantify the accuracy of a given hypothesis, I'm going to use something called the relative entropy. I've written the formula here, you don't have to remember the formula at all. The idea is just to say that I start with a probability distribution on this total space, my initial collection of states, and then I compare it to, I push forward that probability measure. I look at what happens when I forget some information, and then I use my hypothesis to try to guess my probability distribution back, and I need to compare the two. And I'll compare the two for now using this idea of a relative entropy. Sometimes it's also called the relative entropy of recovery because I'm trying to recover my original probability distribution. And I'll also include some mathematical notation. Again, I'll call this X, P, F, Y, Q, and H. Um, but the notation is misleading. This is notation that I learned from um, Baez and Fritz's paper. Um, it actually says that F pushes forward the probability P to Q, but H is just a hypothesis. It doesn't push forward Q to P. Those are just special ones. And I will isolate those in a moment. But in the category that I'll introduce later, these are gonna be the um, objects and morphisms. But let me just say something about relative entropy first before I get there. And it's two really important properties. One is that it's always non-negative. And two, it happens to be zero exactly when that hypothesis that I chose reproduces that probability distribution on the nose. And that motivates the definition of an optimal hypothesis. It's the best hypothesis you can choose given the given data that you have. And it's exactly one that reproduces that probability distribution P back. I didn't draw that in the picture. The picture I have is still a, not the best hypothesis. But if I draw the best picture, I would have removed the reds and they would have all matched up with the blue um, droplets. There's a fact that's important in probability theory is that optimal hypotheses always exist. I can write a formula for them, um, but you can just see from the picture that if I remove enough water from each of the droplets and spread them apart, I can reproduce this probability distribution by some map. And the specific category that we'll be working with to um, characterize relative entropy is called Finstat, and it was introduced by Baez and Fritz as sort of an extension of their theorem uh, with Leinster on um, ordinary entropy to relative entropy. And the objects are just finite probability spaces. And the morphisms, actually, it's a pair of maps. One is the map F that's kind of forgetting some kind of information in a deterministic way. And then there's also a hypothesis that is some attempt to try to recover that information. So these are actually the morphisms between the objects. And you can imagine what should you do for composition? Well, if they line up, you compose functions, you iterate the process for forgetting some information. And then if you have two hypotheses, you can also iterate those. Um, if you've never seen the iteration of stochastic maps, it's essentially just matrix multiplication. You are thinking of a two-step process and you have a probability distribution, um, a conditional probability that tells you how to go from an initial point to a midpoint. And then also a probability from going from that midpoint to the final point, and then you multiply them and then you add up all of those possibilities. And so we can use this category and then try to describe the relative entropy as a functor as well. And in this case, we're going to map to um, not just real numbers, but we're also going to include infinity. <clears throat> 
But the situations, um, I'm going to try to ignore infinity as much as possible because that's kind of like a technical aspect. In fact, John spent a minute or so talking about this in his talk on Wednesday. I'm saying that when, when, the, when they proved their theorem, there were a lot of special cases that one had to consider. It was because of this infinity. So I'm going to ignore those special cases and work in the setting of um, where I don't have to worry about that. And the idea is that you just take this process that you have together with your hypothesis, both of those pieces of information, and then you produce a number out of it. That's the relative entropy. And it turns out that this is a functor. And not only that, but it's the unique lower semi-continuous convex functor that vanishes whenever you give me an optimal hypothesis. So whenever you give me the best hypothesis possible, the deviation measure should be zero. And um, it turns out that it's characterized by these relatively simple properties. And this is their main theorem. So, so far, I'm, this is all re like sort of um, historical recap of um, everything. But I do want to spend a little bit more time on about special cases of what functoriality actually means. Um, and this might maybe bring it home to some of you. I hope. <laughs> I hope it maybe will bring uh, ring a bell for, for at least somebody. Um, if you have two such processes, then relative and then functoriality says that this equation holds. It just says that I can take the relative entropy. If I have these two hypotheses and successive processes, then the functoriality says that I can um, take the sum of the individual components of the deviation, and it equals the deviation from taking the composite of my hypotheses. That's still a little bit abstract, right? <laughs> so let's look at a very, like an even more special case. Um, it looks a little bit complicated, but all I'm going to be working with now are two finite sets rather than three. So it seems like where is compositionality coming in? One of them is going to be a trivial set. Um, so I think uh, Ty called this um, the, the zero simplex, and she, she, she spent a moment on this actually in our talk. Um, it's actually a very important object in this category. Um, because it has its terminal. So it has unique maps going into it. Oh, sorry, it's, it's not terminal in this category because you can have many probability distributions coming out because of the hypotheses. But um, if you ignore the hypotheses, it's terminal in that category. Um, but in any case, you have a unique map to that as a set. And as a result, if you, for instance, fix, so you have these two spaces, X and Y, you fix a deterministic map F, and you fix an initial probability distribution p, you can look at what happens if you try to now um, include other probability distributions, um, q for instance. And when you, when you include all of this information, you can write down a specific equation. Let me just say that functoriality applies to this diagram, gives you an equation that expresses, if you give me any other probability distribution q, and then you compare it to the initial distribution P, and then you post-process it. So you process both of those distributions along the same deterministic map F, and then you take the difference of those two things. It actually equals something very specific. It says taking that the, dis, the difference between the probability distribution Q and then pushing it forward and then trying to recover it. Um, and in this case, when you do this, you'll notice that, so this is called the conditional expectation property. And I want to really emphasize the fact that the left-hand side of this equation may seem familiar to you. Um, it's, it's a term that appears in the data processing inequality. And the data processing inequality always tells you that this is, is greater than or equal to zero. The information that you started with, um, the distance between the two probability distributions that you start with is always greater than or equal to what happens when you take those two distributions and you act on them by the same noisy channel? That's the, that's the rough intuition for what this data processing inequality says. But this is a stronger statement. It says if you have a deterministic map F and then you look at another arbitrary distribution Q, and then if you use a specific map G, which is, which is an optimal hypothesis of F and Q, which we know exists, then it actually also can try to recover as much information as possible from a totally different distribution Q as well. And so it actually gives you, it's sort of like a, a strengthening because it gives you an equality formulation of some data processing inequality in a special case. And I'll talk a little bit 
I'll actually spend a more time on this um, data processing inequality um, later in this talk because it's sort of like a main theme. Um, there's another example of functoriality. I think there were questions asked about this um, earlier, actually about, um, well, let me not reveal what it is yet. <laughs> but if you take um, the product, if you take three random variables and then you construct the um, prob probability distribution on the product of those three sets, and then you take successive projections. So in this case, I've taken um, three random variables. I've constructed the probability distribution on X cross Y cross Z. And then I take one projection at a time. Doesn't matter which letters I chose, I just chosen specific ones here. And I'm gonna take a hypothesis in each of these situations to be the totally unbiased hypothesis. So I'm not using any information at all. I'm just saying, I'm going to randomly select um, uniformly um, the distribution after I've removed that information. So in particular, if I take this um, slightly like yellow green part of the diagram, um, that particular morphism, if I have a probability distribution um, on the base, then the map U just splits up those water droplets evenly. So it's a very special case of uh, two kind of composable morphisms in my category. But nevertheless, when you apply functoriality to this pair of morphisms, you end up reproducing this, you go, go through the math, you show that this equals this equals this, and then you end up getting uh, the chain rule for conditional entropy um, in this situation. So functoriality, the point of this is just to illustrate that functoriality really reproduces a lot of important concepts, all in just this one simple idea of taking something, splitting it up, composing it, and then saying that it equals like the sum of its parts in this sense. So it's, I think it's a very powerful idea and it includes a lot of important um, concepts. Yes, Shane. I feel like I just learned one of your main tools for, for going backwards. So there's like probably a direct choice function or a uniform function. Are there any other obvious ones that if I don't, haven't thought about this or just have in mind? Yeah, so the question is, if you give me an arbitrary, I think this is the question, let me know if it's rephrased correctly. If you give me an arbitrary deterministic map between probability spaces, are there other natural maps that go in reverse, such as choosing a Dirac delta or choosing the uniform distribution? Um, I'll say yes. And the other very natural one is the optimal hypothesis. <laughs> um, uh, so, and I'll try to make that precise also later because it's closely related to the notion of um, Bayesian inference. Any other questions? You know, I'm just, I'm just reminded from David's talk. Yes. I don't know what functoriality means. Yeah, so John, John is just making the remark that in David Spivak's talk, um, he actually asked, he gave a lot of different other properties um, that are useful, um, but not specifically like, you know, there was a question about what, what about functoriality? And I guess this is sort of like a counterpart to that. Like, this is all the things that functoriality can give you. <laughs> so I think it's um, a nice, but balanced uh, viewpoint. Um, yes. So um, I want to go back to this data processing inequality. And let me just formulate it a little bit more precisely um, in case it may have been missed um, how, you know, what the given mathematical data are, what the outputs are, what the claim is. Um, so it says, if you give me a deterministic map between two sets, and you give me a probability distribution, which I've drawn in this um, way, because any stochastic map from a single element set to another set is a probability distribution. So I'm thinking about it like that. And if I set G to be the optimal hypothesis backwards from Y to X, sorry, I'm calling it G now, um, then this particular conditional expectation property is satisfied no matter which probability distribution Q you give me. So this is a special case of what functoriality gave us. But more generally, we can ask what happens if my original map F was stochastic instead? So what if I didn't have a deterministic procedure like roll a die, tell me odd or even, but roll a die, um, you know, 
maybe like somebody's blindfolded a little bit or maybe they can't see everything and then they have to guess odd or even. Um, well, Lee and Winter uh, proved in 2014 a strengthening of the data processing inequality um, that basically reads as follows. If you give me a stochastic map F this time and a probability P on X, and you set G to be the Bayesian inverse of that given data, which I'll define in a moment, then you get a strengthening of the data processing inequality. And which, and when I say data processing, sometimes this is called monotonicity of the relative entropy. Um, and uh, if you are in sort of like the quantum information theory business, um, you'll know that this is the, <laughs> the inequality. Um, it's, it reduces to a, special, a strong subadditivity, for example, um, in the quantum setting. And this is a strengthening of that inequality. So it really gives you um, a much better bounds um, than ordinary monotonicity because it tells you information about trying to recover um, the original probability distribution that you had. And this says that the Bayesian inverse does a very good job, essentially, you know, in, in intuitive terminology. Yeah. Yeah, so Tom asked if there's a quantum version of this and the subject of Lee and Winter's paper is essentially um, a question whether or not something like this holds. Um, and I will come back to that question later on. I don't want to give away the punchline just yet. <laughs> but let me first say what is a Bayesian inverse because a lot of categorical ideas also come into play here. So if you're given a stochastic map F and a probability distribution on X, a Bayesian in, oh, sorry, I was just repeating the statement so that it's still there so we know the importance of the statement. Um, if you're given a map F and a probability distribution P, a Bayesian inverse is a stochastic map in the other direction, which you sort of want to think of as trying to reverse, right? Like trying to reverse time in some sense. And it satisfies a particular property. And I'm going to scare you for a moment, maybe not you, but <laughs> I'll maybe scare some people. Usually I scare um, physicists when I show them this, um, such that the following diagram commutes. And in this diagram, the vertical arrows are just the diagonal map. And uh, I think everything else has been defined, um, except maybe the, the product. But fortunately, just before this talk, um, Tom talked about the product of probability distributions. And this is essentially what you just do. So it's, 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 a, it's a morphism that satisfies a particular equation that can be expressed diagrammatically. What does it mean? Well, if I tell you what happens on specific elements, X and Y, then it looks something like this. And if that's still a little bit bothersome to you, um, you can think about it in terms of conditional probabilities, which says that the conditional probability of Y given X times the probability of X equals the probability of X given Y times the probability of y. And if you've ever taken or taught a course in probability theory, you've written this equation. <laughs> this is Bayes' rule, sorry. <laughs> and so I guess maybe I don't want to, I should stress this enough. This is a categorical formalization of the idea of Bayes' rule. Um, it's not due to me. It's due to Bart Jakob, um, Bart Jakobs and Kent Cho. Um, and it's been elaborated on since, since their work. Um, it may also have earlier origins that I'm less aware of. Um, I think if you look at some papers by Tobias Fritz, um, he has a good historical account of these ideas appearing, maybe in a little bit different format. But let me mention two things that relate this idea of Bayesian inverse back to optimal hypotheses, because they should maybe be related. Um, and the first statement that I want to make, um, which also has a very broad categorical proof too, is if F is deterministic and G happens to be a Bayesian inverse of that pair, then G is automatically an optimal hypothesis. So when my stochastic maps are deterministic, a Bayesian inverse reproduces the notion of an optimal hypothesis. So it's already specializing to that case, which we already know how important it is from that context of relative entropy. Conversely, and this is also quite surprising. If G happens to be an optimal hypothesis, let's say F is still stochastic, but we wrote those equations down. They were purely formal composition. You needed some like partial one-sided identity equation to hold. 
and you needed a probability distribution to be recovered. So if a G is an optimal hypothesis in that sense, then it's a Bayesian inverse, first of all. And second, more importantly, it forces the original map F to have been deterministic to begin with. So what this is telling you roughly is that you have different levels of being able to reverse a process. You can either reverse it categorically speaking if you think of an isomorphism, that's one way. A weaker method, which is using this idea of stochastic maps, is to get an optimal hypothesis. And in a weaker sense still, you can try to reverse even stochastic processes to some degree by this notion of a Bayesian inverse. But, um, you know, as Tom was already getting to the question, and I hope I am not spending too much time on the classical stuff, um, Lee and Winter and quantum, quantum information theorists, um, why is any of this useful to them? What are they trying to gain from it? Well, let me just mention some of the goals in the community and some of the achievements that have been made since the writing of their work. First of all, um, maybe this is, I've already stressed this, um, improving the DPI helps you get tighter bounds, helps you try to recover information better. Um, just by me saying those words, you might think that, um, you know, um, I maybe should have worded this slightly differently. Um, you might think it has something to do with error correcting codes, and in fact, it did, indeed it does, both to perfect and approximate error correcting codes. You might try to extend the second law of thermodynamics beyond just equilibrium situations or even beyond the classical setting. A lot of these ideas could be useful to them there. You want to, some people have been using it to understand entanglement wedge reconstruction in ADS CFT. Um, maybe quite surprising to, to some people. And in fact, you can also even surprisingly apply a lot of these ideas um, to the renormalization group flow in conformal and quantum field theories. Um, you I highly recommend checking out um, Nima Lashkari's work on this, um, on, in this area. It actually has a really nice relationship between um, perfect error correcting codes, um, broken symmetries, approximate error correcting codes, and things like this. So it's really interesting stuff. Um, it's also been used, um, a lot of these ideas have also been used to figure out, um, in some sense, um, some of the ideas that Hawking missed in his calculations um, in the uh, information retrieval of black hole evaporation. Um, so Jeffrey Pennington also has a nice talk on this subject and a lot of um, work by others too, um, have essentially used a lot of these ideas of information recovery and improvements on this data processing inequality to achieve these results. So it's really a, a, a phenomenal amount of work has gone into the subject within the past eight years. So that was a little bit of a motivation. Um, now I wanna move to this quantum side. Um, and I think uh, Tom also briefly mentioned this, um, but I think I'll elaborate on some of these things uh, in some more detail perhaps. Um, I'm going to think of embedding classical systems into quantum systems and um, by doing so, if we have an idea that we've formulated categorically in the former, so in the category of classical systems, and we have such a functor, some kind of an embedding like this, then we can literally transfer those ideas and try to study what they mean in this broader context, how applicable they are, how useful they are, what do they mean in this setting. So if you give me a space X, like a finite probability space, but just look at the space itself, then we can construct its associated algebra functions. So that's an algebra. In fact, it's a star algebra if I think of complex valued functions by just taking the complex conjugate pointwise. And if you give me a probability distribution on X, I can consider the expectation value function on that algebra of functions by just taking the weighted sum of any function by that probability distribution. So it's a dual way of thinking about what a probability is rather than thinking of it as actually a function, like a measure, think about what it does to functions. You can also generalize this a little bit further rather than just thinking about probability distributions on a set X, you can think about it as a stochastic map. What does that become? First, I'll write down the more complicated version. If you give me a function on Y, then I have to give you a function on X. They're going in the opposite direction because functions pull back. 
Um, so if you give me a function on y, I'm going to give you a function on x. Well, what does it do at the value x? Well, at the value x, I have a probability measure on y because of my stochastic map f. And then I take the expectation value of that function with that probability distribution. And if that was a little bit over your head because you're not used to thinking about stochastic maps, let me just tell you what it does in a very special case. When f is deterministic, this literally gives you the pullback. So hopefully at least one of these methods um, sticks to you. Um, if you're comfortable with the pullback method, like the pullback approach, which I think every category theorist is, is comfortable with, I, I would think, um, then a stochastic map, just think of that as like a generalization of the pullback. What happens to a hypothesis? Well, this is kind of one of the useful things about category theory. Um, you can write a lot of different symbols in place. Um, and then, but if you have the categorical picture, all you need to do is replace each, each of those objects with the appropriate object of whatever category you're thinking about. Um, so in this case, a hypothesis, um, we replace it between exactly the data that I had just presented above. Yes. Um, I, maybe you're not catching it for a reason. Um, when you say completely positive, is it completely positive? Or uh, positive? I don't have to. They don't have to be completely positive. Um, in fact, um, yeah, so the question was, um, why did I only write positive maps here instead of completely positive? And um, a stochastic map between commutative algebra, sorry, a completely positive map between commutative algebras, the set of completely positive maps when one of your algebras is commutative is equal to the set of positive maps. And so the category theory alone in this sense doesn't tell me which of those classes to choose from, but there are other categorical features associated to completely positive maps that are appropriate, such as being able to take tensor products. So if you want to take tensor products of non-commutative algebras and positive maps between them, that's when completely positive maps come into play. So yes, in general, the tensor product of two positive maps is not positive in, the category, in this larger category where you include non-commutative algebras. And this is also important for physical reasons. Um, you want to be able to say that if I take the evolution of one given system and then I adjoin it to another system and just assume it's sitting there, I want to make sure that that evolution is also positive no matter which input state I throw into the system. But the point is, is that a hypothesis is essentially the same definition as it was in the classical setting. It's just I can't draw a picture. <laughs> I wish I could, but I don't have a good picture for this. Um, but so this is really what I want to stress. If you, because if there's a lot of stuff on this slide, zoom out a little bit and look at just the highlighted pieces. Um, they all essentially look the same. I'm just using different symbols for them. And there is also a precise way to formulate this in terms of monads and Claisley categories, but I'm not going to say that. I'll just mention what I just said right now. If that means anything to you, it may feel comforting. Um, but there are also a lot of subtle differences that happen in the setting of quantum mechanics that are sometimes um, maybe surprising. Classically, the information loss associated to any deterministic process is always non-negative, as John Baez stressed out. And if you actually look at their proof of the theorem, it's so important that, that, this is, that this holds. The proof of this combined with functoriality essentially, um, and of course, Fideyev's theorem, um, that's also a very key element, but positivity of this um, information loss is so crucial. Unfortunately, <laughs> it fails in the quantum mechanical setting. Um, and I think this was part of the reason, um, if you look at their original blog post, or maybe follow-ups of it, I'm not sure, um, part of the main reason why they could not find um, an analog of this in the setting of quantum mechanics. And just to give you an intuition for why something like this might happen in the quantum mechanical setting in the first place, um, if you take a pure state on a system, and then if you take a measurement, like let's say you have a spin up system, and then you decide to measure the spin in the x direction or something like that, then the probability distribution on the set of spin x's, whether it's spin up x or spin down x, um, is actually going to be 50-50. So you've taken something that has zero entropy, and you've produced something, a probability distribution that has entropy like 
I'm going to embarrass myself. I don't know, two log two or log two. There's just some twos in there and some logs. It's, it's, it's positive. <laughs> it's, it's a positive quantity. Yeah? It's, I guess if you're in Nats, yeah, it's like one. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so exactly. So the point, but the point is it's positive. Oh, sorry, it's negative. You're taking the difference. Um, it's a pure state which has zero minus this positive entity, which is negative. Um, and of course, it also reproduces um, non negative entropy differences when you just take commutative algebras. So you're like, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to prove anything with this. Uh, I'll get back to that in a moment. There's another problem. <laughs> so this was the first part was about the ordinary von Neumann entropy. There's a second problem that also occurs for relative entropy too. Um, and it's that classically optimal hypotheses always exist. There's no problem in trying to construct one. I gave you a def, I gave you an explicit formula for it a moment ago. In quantum, they don't always exist. So this is also another problem. And it's in some sense, this has been thought of as the main problem in trying to understand conditioning in quantum mechanics. This is the main problem. But let me give you an interesting fact. If you have a morphism between probability spaces, commutative, not commutative, whatever, if you know an optimal hypothesis exists, which it does in the classical setting, the entropy difference is always non-negative. So maybe this is why, one of the reasons potentially why um, Baez, Fritz, and Leinster were able to prove their theorem. Um, and that actually is one of the key ingredients. Um, so I'm not going to tell you what the precise theorem is, but I did prove this theorem that actually the quantum entropy is classified, it is characterized as a certain convex, um, continue, appropriately continuous um, functor um, on the category of quantum space of, of non-commuted probability spaces in the finite dimensional setting. And this is one of the key observations of that. Yeah, absolutely. So the last line, thank you, actually, you didn't I notice. Line, see it, but, we in the room but you can't see it. Okay, so I'll just read it. So this was one of the key observations in extending the bias fritz leinster theorem to the setting of quantum or von Neumann entropy. And if you would like, um, I think I gave a talk specifically dedicated to this um, theorem um, in uh, Noson Yanovsky's uh, category theory seminar. Um, so you can check that out online. It's sorry, only if uh, it's it's characterized. I don't I don't know what I said, but the von Neumann entropy is characterized by certain convex um, um, convex linear uh, continuity and functoriality properties. And um, yeah, and you and you don't need non you don't need like non negativity. There are other I can't remember exactly what I proved anymore. It's been a while, but um, the precise statement is like on the first few pages I think of my paper. Um, and all I remember is, it's it's funny. I don't know. I, maybe I get this from Dennis Sullivan. He's like, I can't I can't always remember the exact details of something, but like when you prove something, there's like a key idea that shows up, and sometimes you know you remember that more than you remember the statement of the theorem. This is one of those instances where that happens. <laughs> okay, um, so that's about the ordinary von Neumann entropy. Uh, let me also briefly talk about the quantum relative entropy, because that's also something I um, spent a little bit of time thinking about. Um, but again, as you could imagine, uh, all you really have to do is now once you have this idea of what replaces classical systems, um, you can try to guess that it, maybe it should be straightforward. So the idea is that you just take a non-commutative version of the category I introduced earlier, of non-commutative probability spaces. Morphisms are deterministic maps together with a hypothesis. Again, I can't draw a picture for this, but that's roughly the idea. And then relative entropy should probably be some assignment that takes this process, deterministic process, together with the hypothesis. By the way, an example of in the fully quantum mechanical sense of what such a map F might be like um, is the partial trace of a system, for example. Um, but I'm what's called, I'm in the Heisenberg picture. Um, usually the partial trace is in the Schrodinger picture, but 
you know, if in words, you can think of like the partial trace as an example of such a deterministic procedure. But anyway, that's just an example. So you can also associate um, a relative entropy to such pair to compare the two probability distributions or the states um, as they are called. You can try to compare the two states with that hypothesis. And I won't even write the formula down because it's not, I won't be using the actual explicit formula. It has the same properties um, as I mentioned earlier, non-negativity and equals zero if and only if you actually get the right state. Um, so I, I checked that this defines a convex functor, um, at least when the states satisfy these appropriate support conditions and I don't have to worry too much about infinity. Um, so it's, that's actually true. Um, it's interesting because um, a disintegration theorem that um, I proved with a collaborator of mine, Benjamin Russo, was actually used in the proof of this. So it's quite interesting that two things I was thinking about somehow ended up um, in the same realm. Maybe not so surprising because um, almost everything is related in quantum information theory. So, um, but in progress, I will mention some things um, just to <laughs> be like everybody else, have to mention something about what's in progress. Uh, functor reality, of course, for all states, lower semi continuity, and then hopefully a characterization theorem. Um, I don't yet know if it's characterized. I assume it is. Um, if you're careful enough, um, it should work through. But let me also mention what functor reality specializes to. Just like before, it produces the conditional expectation property, which is a theorem that was proved in the 80s by Petz. Um, and it's frequently used in the literature of quantum information theory. There's also the chain rule for quantum, quantum conditional entropy. Essentially the same diagram, just partial traces. Um, but, and this is maybe answering Tom's question, uh, the Lee Winter um, strength and data processing inequality fails. Namely, the statement that if you give me a stochastic map or CP map, um, CPU map F and a state on A, does there exist a map in the other direction such that this strength and data processing inequality holds no matter which other probability distribution or state you give me? And the answer is no. But variants in weaker versions have been found. Oh, when I say the answer is no, I'm saying no in full generality, like no in the math sense. Right? When you make a claim in math, you say, is it true for all cases? Um, the answer is no, it's not true for all cases. But variants in weaker versions have been found. Um, and this is part of the big business and part of what um, helped, for instance, um, being able to recover information from black hole evaporation. Um, and in progress, a question that I've sort of been toying with for quite a while now, with some of my collaborators is, is this true nevertheless, if you have a Bayesian inverse? So Bayesian inverses satisfy a lot of interesting properties. Um, and you might think maybe this tool that was sort of coming from categorical probability theory applied to the setting of quantum mechanics, um, maybe, and, and its connection to optimal hypotheses and the equality version of the strength and data processing inequality, at least I think maybe, or at least I have some hope that maybe such a map could provide conditions under which this strength and data processing inequality does hold. And it is known to hold for many, many special cases of maps that are Bayesian invertible. That's also support for why I think something like this is true and probably one of the main things I'm thinking about these days. Um, I think I have, do I have one minute left or? Um, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I think this is my last slide, but I'll try to go quick. So there are many categorical approaches to entropy, both from the classical and quantum side. Shannon entropy was classified by Bayes, Fritz, and Linster. Um, a few years, maybe many years later, um, I was able to prove an analogous theorem for the von Neumann entropy. Conditional entropy in the classical setting also has a very interesting categorical perspective where functoriality is dropped and it's replaced with the weaker categorical notion that I can't get into, um, but I believe it may also provide um, interesting ideas in category theory itself. Um, there's like a weaker notion of a functor. It's not quite what homotopy theorists might think or higher infinity category theorists might think about. It's a little bit different than that, um, but it's an interesting notion anyway that's even appeared um, in recent work on like free, free Markov categories by um, Fritz and um, Wengong, I think. So also conditional entropy in the quantum setting is something in progress. Um, 
relative entropy, as Baez mentioned, was done by himself and Fritz and Gagne and Panangaden in the infinite dimensional setting. Relative entropy is still in progress, partial results, but any infinite dimensional generalizations of any of this stuff is, as far as I'm aware, unknown, but very important, especially in the setting of quantum field theories in um, curved space time. Of course, there's also homological, operatic, topos theoretic characterizations that I didn't even talk about, but were perhaps mentioned. Uh, in fact, they were mentioned in some earlier talks. And of course, the big question is, um, you know, I was initially interested in this because I wanted to piece together a lot of different ideas of entropy coming from, you know, geometry, Perelman's work, um, topological dynamic, topological dynamical systems, all these different notions of entropy. And I would hope that there's sort of like a unifying picture coming from category theoretic ideas. Um, and I sort of maybe <laughs> tried to do the best thing I could, which was try to extend that realm to the quantum mechanical setting as best as I could. But of course, it's still a very broad um, thing to look into what sort of tools um, connects all of these different ideas together. So um, thank you for your attention. Um, these are some of the references that showed up in my talk. Thanks. Any questions? Um, Sure. I also can't see if anyone is asking here, but okay. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, it's, I think I've heard of this being done, but don't quote me on that. It sounds very familiar. Yeah. The, sorry, the question was essentially um, are any of these inequalities that I mentioned um, possibly useful in, the, in a machine learning context in particular? Can you think of like relative entropy as a cost function in some sense? Um, and I don't personally know, but that sounds so familiar that I wouldn't be surprised if it hasn't been looked into. I don't know if applications of this particular, like the Lee-Winter inequality have been applied in that setting. That I don't know. In particular, I should have mentioned that um, that inequality looked rather simple. And as far as I'm aware, and many other, I believe many other quantum information theorists are aware, Lee and Winter were the first to write it down in 2014. So I, I, I don't know if this inequality has been known in the like information theoretic or classical probability community, um, but it's you know relating data processing inequality Bayesian inversion. I wouldn't be surprised if it is, but many people I've spoken to cite Lee Winter as the first reference that states the classical version of this theorem. And it's, it's a simple, it's like a couple line proof using um, uh, Jensen's inequality. So it's, it's even a simple proof, which breaks down in the quantum mechanical setting. <laughs> if you use the Pets recovery map. Well, so, so there is unique, yes, there's uniqueness. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, uh, essentially, in my characterization theorem, do you get uniqueness? And um, what is, where is Fadeyev's theorem showing up in some sense? I mean, I was thinking that Fadeyev points to a theorem that has like three conditions. So you need to satisfy by showing the Yeah, so Baez, Fritz, and Lenster's theorem have these three conditions where entropy is uniquely characterized by them. And I... Correct. Yes. So the statement is that there exists a set of conditions um, that imply Bayes, Fritz, and Leinster's conditions that uniquely characterize the von Neumann entropy. And functoriality is included in them. And functoriality and convexity relate very closely to Fadeyev's 
um, assumptions, conditions. Thank you. Okay, so I just want to um, conclude uh, con conclude um, by thanking all of the speakers. Um, I really appreciate uh, everyone taking the time to make beautiful slides and and explain things um, clearly. Take questions. Um, I, I I really appreciate it. Uh, I want to thank um, Goen again and and Vadim, who's the director of ITS, who's you know, very um, open and, and and welcoming for for um, people doing interesting things in theoretical science. Um, and then thank everyone that came, the people in person and the people uh, online on Zoom um, for, you know, uh, participating and asking great questions and um, generally being uh, forgiving of the the difficulties in, in in running a hybrid event, but it's great, you know, at the breaks to see heated discussions at the board and heated discussions in the chat, and uh, uh, even even if they didn't didn't um, mingle or intertwine uh, as, as much um, as if everyone were in the same place.